saying some of the things we are working on in Innsbruck. So um, we are trying to use uh, superconducting qubits for, or circuits, I should say, for a couple of different things. Uh, we want to couple them to uh, micromechanical oscillators using magnetic fields. We are trying to use them to build structures we can use for amplifiers and single photon microwave switches. And the topic I want to talk about today is how we want to use them to build systems uh, to perform analog quantum simulation. So here's a short outline of my talk. I want to first give you an introduction to circuit QED, uh, sort of what are cavities, how do we realize qubits, how do we couple the two. Uh, and that brings me then to how we want to combine these systems uh, to essentially build up something uh, with which we can perform uh, a simulation, an analog simulation of dipolar quantum magnetism on lattices in the long run. Uh, and then in the end, I uh, want to show you some first experiments towards that direction. Okay, so I guess most of you are familiar with cavity QED. Um, and the idea in circuit QED is we essentially take the optical resonator we have and replace it with a microwave resonator. Uh, so of course, we have to then you know, use instead of optical photons, microwave photons. Um, now, that's not so different to what Sasha Roche has done in, in, uh, for what he got the Nobel Prize for. The main difference in circuit QD is really that we don't use atoms as our two-level systems, but essentially we are using nonlinear quantum circuits. So we have a much larger design flexibility and some certain advantages. Now, over the course of the last years, this field has uh, taken off. There's many, many groups around the world. This is, I think, not even a 50% complete list, meanwhile. Um, so, so people are working on quantum information processing, quantum simulation, quantum optics experiments. Uh, they investigate quantum measurements, and so on and so forth. Now, um, as you can see here, a cavity QED system and also circuit QED system essentially consists of two building blocks, the cavity and the qubit. So let's first talk about our cavities. Um, so what we are using in Innsbruck are these waveguide microwave resonators. So what you can see here is actually the two halves uh, of such a resonator, so you bolt them together, and essentially this is a superconducting box. So this is aluminum, um, and we can send microwave signals into this box and it comes out, so the, unfortunately the microwave couplers are not shown here. Um, and if you look at the fundal mode of this resonator, um, so it's about lambda half in size, you get something which looks like what you would get from a drum sort of. So you have an electric field maximum in the center, the electric field points in the C direction, uh, it has to go to zero on the side walls. Um, so the advantage of these resonators is they are very, very easy to build. So essentially you can send one of your PhD students or you go yourself into the workshop, machine it out of a solid block of aluminum. Uh, you bolt it together, you cool it down, and you see that you can observe quality factors in excess of a million. So reaching up to 10 million is very, very easy and very straightforward in such a system. Now, what sort of pretty much every microwave resonator um, sort of uh, can be described with is essentially, well, around the resonance at least, is essentially a parallel combination of an inductor and a capacitance. Now it turns out I have an associated charge and flux and I can quantize those. I can write down a Hamiltonian by just adding up the charging energy and the energy stored in this inductance. Um, Charge and flux are conjugate variables, so actually what I'm allowed to do is I'm allowed to write down ladder operators just as I would have done for a regular harmonic oscillator. And if I now take these expressions and put them up here, what I get out is just a regular quantum harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian, where instead of, for example, a mass and a spring constant, I have now my inductance and capacitance, or alternatively, if you prefer, a resonance frequency and a so-called characteristic impedance. Now, typical resonance frequencies for superconducting circuits are somewhere in the 4 to 10 gigahertz range, um, and this characteristic impedance is somewhere between 1 and 100 ohms. Um, so essentially what we have is we have this harmonic potential, we have equidistant energy levels, uh, so in some sense we already have a quantized system, a quantum circuit, but it's sort of boring. I mean, I can cool it down, I put it in one of our cryostats, I cool it down to 10, 20 millikelvin, it will be in the ground state, but if I now apply a classical drive, nothing so much exciting happens. All I will get out is sort of a coherent state, so a very classical quantum state. 
Um, the key ingredient that's actually missing is the nonlinearity. Uh, and that brings me immediately to how we do qubits. Um, and then you'll see how we do the so-called 3D transmon. Um, so the key ingredient is really this nonlinearity. And the nonlinearity uh, in superconducting circuits we actually realize with the so-called Josephson junction. So the junction is nothing else but a superconductor insulator superconductor sandwich. So this insulating barrier is very thin, about a nanometer, typically aluminum oxide. Now Cooper pairs um, sort of can tunnel completely dissipationless across this barrier. Uh, and you can actually look at the Josephson equations and then figure out what's actually the energy associated with this tunneling. And you find it's given by minus Ej. This is the so-called Josephson energy, which is essentially just a constant uh, depending on uh, what material of superconductor did I use, what's the barrier, what's the dimensions of the barrier, and how thick is the barrier. Um, and then the cosine of phi, and phi is actually the phase difference between uh, the macroscopic wave function of the Cooper-Bear condensate here on the top and the bottom. So this is the phase difference of those two wave functions. Um, now, if you think about, and if you, if you look at that a little more closely, it turns out that this is very close uh, to actually uh, what the energy would be uh, if you write down an inductor. Uh, also, the, the current uh, voltage relation would look very similar. So very often, actually, these Josephson junctions are also called nonlinear inductances, to, to some order at least. Um, now, if you look a little more closely, um, you know, this is not only sort of, I cannot only have this tunneling event, this is also sort of a metallic plate, an insulator, and another metallic plate. And maybe if I say it like that, you can see that this also looks a little bit like a tiny capacitance. So there's not only this tunneling energy associated with this element, but also we have a small charging energy, um, so this, which is sort of given by this capacitance. Um, as a circuit element, people actually use uh, sort of a box with a cross inside to say this is, well, this is a Josephson junction which has this Hamiltonian. It turns out it's actually now very, very easy to make a qubit out of that. All I have to do is I add a bigger capacitance in parallel, so nothing much happened to my Hamiltonian with the exception that now this sort of uh, capacitance has been modified, I have to add up the capacitance of the junction and this parallel capacitance to something bigger. Um, and I've actually created a qubit, it turns out. And this is the so-called transmon qubit, which is at the moment one, one of the most widely used uh, qubits we have in the community. Um, so how can we understand what goes on here? Well, the, one of the easiest ways of viewing it is let's take this cosine term here and Taylor expand it. Um, and now I've done that here in, in sort of units of a quasi-flux, and I've divided it by the flux quantum here. So what you then get out is, again, a flux and a charge operator. So these first two terms you can see right there is, again, pretty much a harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian, nothing much. Um, but now I have this phi to the fourth correction term, and so that's sort of where the magic comes in. Uh, because if I now do use the same replacement rules for charge and flux like I did for my harmonic oscillator, I get out a slightly modified Hamiltonian. So again, harmonic oscillator, but now I have this additional B dagger B squared, so a nonlinearity in my quantum circuit, and the size of the nonlinearity is actually given by this charging energy. So what has happened is that I've essentially gone from this harmonic uh, from this parabolic potential to a cosine potential, and my energy levels, instead of now being equidistant, start to sort of bunch up. Um, so, um, meaning that sort of as I go up in this potential well, the, the sort of uh, energy levels come closer and closer um, until sort of I can really say that sort of down here, if I only shine in radiation at this energy difference, I actually have my two level system. Um, typical resonance frequencies in this case are again somewhere in the 5 to 10 gigahertz range uh, and the enharmonicity, enharmonicity, so the energy difference between sort of going from uh, comparing the 0 to 1 transition to the 1 to 2 transition is somewhere like 200 to 300 megahertz, right around there. Um, okay, so that's uh, how we do qubits. So let me for a moment stay a little longer in this sort of circuit language uh, to think about how we can actually couple a qubit to a resonator. Um, 
Drawing a circuit is actually quite easy, so all I have to do is I have to add a capacitance between my resonator and my qubit. So I have my two-level system, my harmonic oscillator, and now sort of to understand the coupling, one of the easiest essentially classical ways to think about it is if I have an excitation living in my qubit, I'll have an associated electric field here in this capacitance, and then I have this capacitive divider right here. So what will happen is that I'll also get an electric field over there in the resonator. So if one does that a little bit more carefully, really figures out what goes on here, does a rotating wave approximation and so on, what you'll actually get out is this interaction Hamiltonian. So on resonance, the qubit and the resonator will exchange excitations. So whenever I annihilate an excitation in the qubit, I create one in the resonator and vice versa. And sort of nowadays circuits can sort of typically have interaction strength somewhere between 50 and a few hundred megahertz. Uh, and I guess that Hamiltonian most of you are familiar with, this is the famous James Cummings Hamiltonian essentially, um, and we can use that to, in the dispersive regime to read out our qubits, we can use the resonator to mediate interaction, to drive the qubits, and so forth. Um, there's a little thing I want to add here is I can also actually replace this resonator with another qubit. And I can write down the same coupling capacitance and there's not much that changes, but it means that I can also capacitively couple qubits and sort of mediate interactions in that way. Um, so my Hamiltonian didn't change by much. Instead of an uh, A dagger and an A, I now get a uh, sigma a plus and sigma minus, so again, qubits, which are capacitively coupled, can on resonance exchange interactions uh, with, with this sort of um, exchange or flip-flop interaction. Again, interaction strength can be around 50 to, well, a few hundred megahertz in this case. So how does a, such a system in our case actually look like? So not, not that one, but a, a qubit uh, coupled to a cavity. Well, um, so this is a picture you can see here. Essentially, we have this big microwave resonator. This time, it's not made out of aluminum, but out of copper for, for reasons we want to, well, we want to apply a magnetic field, essentially. Um, so, and then in here, you see a, a piece of silicon uh, with this, you know, silver structure up here on top. Uh, so essentially, if I make a zoom out, that's what you can see. So the junction sits here in the middle, then you have those two wings. Uh, this whole structure is about a millimeter in height. Um, so you can easily see it with your bare eye. Uh, now these two plates here actually serve two purposes. Uh, on one hand, it actually creates the right capacitance uh, such that I actually get a transform qubit, so it's just the right size, and it's essentially a little dipole antenna. So because the, the mode volume of my cavity has increased so much that the electric field strength actually went down, I had to pretty much increase the dipole moment of my artificial atom. And that's what we have done. So essentially, if you think about the electric field in the cavity, it would point sort of in this direction. It has a significant overlap with sort of the electric field that would go from one plate of the qubit to another. Um, so this couples quite strongly. Um, if you sort of, you know, want to make a very hand-waving argument, you could say, oh, it's essentially sort of a Cooper pair oscillating across this whole millimeter. And uh, such, uh, which means I could say, okay, this guy has a dipole moment of something like 10 to the 70 pi. So like five orders, six orders in magnitude stronger than any atom uh, we, we, or any molecule we have at hand. Now what is quite nice though is that sort of with these uh, qubits, sort of the best, or qubits in these cavities, the best coherence times we have observed in such a system is right around 100 microseconds, so T1 and T2. Um, um, I would say more regularly in experiments nowadays, sort of uh, all, pretty much all the groups see a few tens of microseconds uh, coherence times, right around there. Um, okay, so, so that's, this is the essentially fundamental system. These are the fundamental building blocks we want to use then to try and build an Eleanor quantum simulator. Um, you can find more details in this physical review B um, where we sort of joined forces with, with Peter Solo and Marcello sitting over there to figure out what we can and want to do with it. And there's sort of a, a couple more papers by Florian Marquardt's group uh, working on spin chains. Um, okay, so what's the basic idea, I guess I don't have to repeat sort of the idea of quantum simulation again. Uh, so essentially we want to sort of build 
a, a simulator of a quantum system, which is very hard or essentially impossible to simulate on a classical computer. Now, this depends on very much what I want to know about that system. Uh, is it a frustrated system? Um, do I want to know dynamics or just ground state? Um, so, uh, and our idea is really sort of to try and map some of those Hamiltonians onto our qubit cavity system because we have it much better under control and we can change parameters. Okay, so uh, sort of the, the, the sketch is, is the following. Let's take a cavity and let's put many, many qubits in there. We can arrange them on lattices. They have this large dipole uh, moment so they can interact directly with another. And then we can sort of start up uh, trying to, you know, maybe start with spin chain physics or maybe sort of have two chains uh, in parallel, sort of create this ladder system, work our way up to full 2D lattices. And as I'll show you in a little bit, actually it turns out we can sort of create a quite unique system, which is we sort of have um, these interacting few body systems, so I don't know, five, six, ten maybe, uh, which then talk via an open quantum system, a waveguide actually, with another such system. And I think we have a very unique uh, thing here, which uh, I guess can create very interesting systems. So to really see if we can sort of realize these kind of systems, we first sort of um, did some uh, finite element modeling. So this is actually quite convenient for all of our circuits. We, could, we can put them in a finite element solver and really figure out the interaction strength, resonance frequencies, and pretty much all parameters for the experiment. So what you can see here is sort of a model of a cavity with a piece of sapphire in here, and then there's two qubits uh, sitting um, on that piece of sapphire, and you can sort of see the mesh and on that mesh, this program actually solves pretty much Maxwell's equations. You'll you know, get resonance frequencies out, you get electric fields out, we can vary parameters and sort of change the frequency of one qubit and sort of see so essentially avoided crossings, pretty much completely classical, of course. And from that, we can figure out what's the interaction strength of two qubits with another, of the qubit with the cavity, and so on. Now, if we do that for two of those qubits inside a cavity, um, then um, we find the following thing. So we start out with sort of two qubits being aligned like that, and we push them apart. And what you can see is we can achieve interaction strength of at about a millimeter distance of a few hundred megahertz. Uh, but as we pull them apart, actually, this interaction strength goes down. Uh, we have done this for three different antenna lengths. So the three different sizes of the dipole moment, essentially. And you can see that sort of all of those curves uh, seem to meet in one point, and then they sort of acquire this tail. Now, this point. Yes, both. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll explain it. I just was about to explain it exactly. So um, um, the, the tail, let's start like that then. The tail actually comes from the cavity mediated interaction. That's essentially very long range because it's given by the cavity mode. Um, um, that left side here is actually dominated by the direct capacitive interaction. And at the zero right there, actually, the two cancel because they have opposite signs. So I can have actually two qubits sitting in this cavity right around like three and a half, four millimeters in this particular case, and they would not interact with each other at all uh, because sort of those two interaction strengths completely cancel. Um, um, so uh, we can also sort of then take the qubits and sort of rotate them from sort of this, this par from this parallel uh, interaction sort of around each other until they are aligned, and we see that the interaction strength goes from z uh, minus a value to zero to two times that, but positive. Now, the, maybe to, to emphasize, the open circuit, circles are actually the final element simulations, um, and I haven't really told you what those lines are. The lines are actually just a very, uh, essentially, uh, uh, pretty much one parameter fit uh, to, uh, to, to using this model, and this is essentially just a one over r cubed and uh, cosine of the respective angles, so pretty much just a dipole-dipole interaction. Um, and to sort of go from the blue to the red to the black curve, all we have to do is actually rescale by the length of the qubit squared, and that's pretty much it. 
Uh, of course, we have to add this, this cavity mediated term, which sort of gives us um, these tails, but we can get those parameters out sort of independently, and we don't have to fit them. Okay, so these qubits really behave like dipoles. We can change the interaction strength just by rotating them um, or placing them at different distances. So the idea is really we think we can build up this a system like that, tailor the interactions to the Hamiltonian we like. Um, we can then also uh, rotate them in the cavity such that we you know, can only read out the qubits we are interested in um, and really try and measure correlations. Now, trying to do that on a system like I've shown up here, which is something like, I don't know, 25 qubits or so, um, is maybe not that realistic. So um, if you really think about, uh, we could build such a system, but then we actually couldn't learn what goes on there because it would be way too complicated and we don't have enough, enough sort of knobs to really turn. So maybe something like this central aid I've put here in this dashed uh, box, that would be feasible. So how can we scale this up to something a little larger? Uh, and that's actually where, oh yeah, so we can maybe do some small instances of like spin chain physics in such a case, or this sort of X, Y model on a ladder. Um, now, um, actually, if you want to scale up the system, the idea is to combine this with the waveguide, because now we don't have this length restriction of the cavity. We can just make this waveguide pretty much as long as we want. We can have many, many, many qubits in there. Uh, but now we don't have the cavity for the readout, so what we actually do here is we introduce these black U-shaped lines, and those are little lambda half resonators, which can sort of interact with the traveling wave going through this waveguide, uh, which actually allows us to have a much more fine-grained readout exactly at the locations where we want it. Again, I don't want to do state tomography or anything on this whole system, but I want to measure enough correlations, excitations, maybe global magnetization or something like that to extract what phase I'm in and the physics what goes on. Um, so yeah, sort of this, this waveguide is actually very convenient uh, and it actually gives us a few more things we can investigate. Um, so we have these sort of short range dipole-like interactions but we have something where these qubits can also talk to the waveguide and have sort of a long range photonic mediated interaction. There's band engineering possible. I mean, these waveguides net, this waveguide naturally has a low frequency cutoff, but we can do something more complicated like build in uh, band stop filters and so on. Um, now for the specialists, sort of, we have an inbuilt Purcell protection in this case because I just park my qubits below the cutoff and even though they are very strongly coupled to the resonator, they won't decay, so they're protected in this case. And one can even think about dissipative state engineering. Uh, so, and that really, you know, should allow us to build systems of that kind where I have sort of an interacting few body system talking to another one for much further away. So here you can see a, a sort of a first incarnation of such a waveguide. Microwaves would be sort of coupled into here. Again, this is one half, and in there there's a, a little qubit we can sort of talk to and the, uh, the wave would just propagate through and come out the other side. Now, um, for these systems, there's a couple open questions. So, you know, uh, how do we best characterize them? What exactly is it we want to measure? Um, how do we, in the end, verify and validate our measurements? You know, is it, does it really meaningful what we get out? And I think one of the big questions is also, how, do I, how would I do that in this open system case? So what's the observables I want to see there? Now, for that reason, we actually paired up with, with Marcello and Peter to, at least for one of those models, try and figure out what we can do and what we want to do. And so this is this XY model on the ladder. So essentially two rows of spins. I have one interaction strength J2 within a, a chain. And between the two chains, I have this J1 interaction strength. So we can build up a system like that. Um, so the Hamiltonian is essentially just this exchange Hamiltonian. Now instead of sigmas, uh, here we use S. Uh, and on top of that, though, we have this term here, which is essentially coming uh, from the fact that all of our qubits are man-made. So we have a slight disorder in the resonance frequencies, so all of them have slightly different resonance frequencies. So we have to take that into account and really see if this disorder is a problem. 
Um, now, in, for this XY model on a ladder, you, for, for a certain um, a ratio of J2 over J1, you actually get this so-called timer phase where you have triplet states sort of on all of those pairs across this, this ladder. Um, so, uh, actually, Marcello has run numerical simulations for us and sort of to, for example, see if he can um, find or get a fingerprint for this dimer phase. And one way to do that is look at these uh, so-called bond correlations or bond order parameter. So, essentially, I want to measure correlations of the form sort of as Z as Z as X as X. And um, um, that would sort of give me a very definite fingerprint of being in this dimer phase. So um, sort of if I sort of reach this, this negative value of one quarter, so spin half times spin half gives you a quarter, exactly right around there for J2 over J1, right around one half, that's exactly when we are completely in this dimer phase. And that should be a very easy uh, to sort of see fingerprint in our case. So uh, I can sort of, of course, you don't necessarily want to measure all the correlations across the whole um, um, letter, so it turns out only measuring a couple of those correlations should actually be enough to give you a very nice uh, and solid indication you are in this phase. Uh, we've also looked into what happens if we introduce disorder um, to the system, and so we can sort of see that this characteristic fingerprint vanishes, uh, but uh, we think in experiments we can realize something which is sort of this dark blue curve, or maybe even slightly better. Uh, so essentially, all the physics with the disorder we have should stay alive, and we should really be able to investigate that. Um, now, uh, yeah, and sort of because I really want to talk about some of the experiments, I think I have like a little more than 10 minutes or so. Yeah, OK. So um, we've also looked at what happens if you add dissipation, how would you use adiabatic state preparations to prepare this dimer phase, and so on. And all of that looks uh, pretty, pretty good. OK, so let me talk a little bit about the experimental progress, so really the very, very first steps towards that direction. So uh, we have single qubits uh, in our labs. We have full single qubit control, so we can drive Rabi oscillations, uh, do single shot uh, measurement. Uh, we have T1 times uh, for single uh, um, junction qubit, so not frequency tunable ones of right around 40 microseconds T1 and a few 10 microseconds T2. We can make them frequency tunable if you want. Uh, we have looked into whether uh, two of those qubits inside a cavity really interact in the way we think they should do, whether those simulations we have done actually make sense. And for example, we can sort of see this avoided crossing between two qubits. So here, uh, sort of this line here is actually, um, so this is doing spectroscopy on those qubits. So this line here, this is a fixed frequency qubit, and I actually take another one which, where we can change the frequency by applying a magnetic field, and I can tune it into resonance. So at first, please ignore this, this central line here. You can sort of see this nice avoided crossing. And another thing is, if you look carefully, it's not perfectly visible. Actually, this lower line here seems to vanish. And this vanishing is actually an indication that right around uh, at where they are in resonance, actually it's not qubit left and qubit right anymore, but it's really symmetric and anti-symmetric state of those two qubits that talk to the cavity. And because of symmetry reasons, the anti-symmetric state of the qubit actually does not talk to the cavity and it vanishes in the spectroscopy. Um, uh, and actually, if you look more carefully, so it's not that easily visible, actually, if you look at then the line with here, that guy actually doubles because it's, it's uh, coupled stronger. Um, this central line here is actually a two-photon process, actually, um, where we go from the ground state to the double excited state of the qubits. So that's why that guy actually shows up here. But the splitting here, this 2J, is pretty much exactly what we would expect out of our, out of our simulations. OK, so we have these qubits uh, in the resonators. They seem to uh, you know, obey the simulations we, we, uh, we, we have done. Uh, we can actually, it turns out, quite easily build up a whole chain of them. We can just, you know, just fill up all of those slots in the cavity. Um, one of the sort of important ingredients that was still missing is uh, that, well, during the simulation, I want to have all of those qubits as perfectly as possible on the same resonance frequency. But then after I've done my simulation, I want to be able to measure these correlators. So um, 
And that means, though, that these qubits can't all be on resonance, because then they will interact strongly. So what I have to do is I want to take those qubits and detune them fast out of the resonance, and then try and measure correlations on a pair of those. Uh, on the other way around, maybe in the beginning, I'm interested in trying to bring in excitations in the system to prepare a certain state, maybe also to uh, look at dynamics or something like that. So essentially, what we need is fast flux tunability. Now, um, it turns out doing getting magnetic fields or time varying magnetic fields in a metallic box is not that trivial. Uh, even if, say, the, the uh, box is uh, just regular copper, because of the eddy currents, you'll see that this acts as a low pass, and you know you can maybe get time varying fields of a few hertz in there, but not like hundreds of megahertz. Uh, if it's made out of a superconductor, it gets even worse, because then you can't even get the magnetic field through. Um, so what do we do? Well, there's ideas you can essentially just uh, sort of get a wire in there. That's not ideal because, you know, then your, your qubit has a way of coupling to that wire and essentially the coherence time would go down. So our way of doing that is actually ins was inspired by um, collaborators in Barcelona uh, where they developed the so-called magnetic hose. So that essentially allows us to bypass the superconductor such that it doesn't see the magnetic flux uh, and get this uh, magnetic field inside the cavity. So the basic idea coming out of transformation optics pretty much applied to static magnetic fields is I want to create a material which has uh, a mu r in parallel to the propagation direction, which is infinite, but I want to have a mu r perpendicular, which is zero. And if you think about that, this would really sort of whatever magnetic field I have here in the input route perfectly to the output. Uh, well, it turns out, of course, um, well, we have uh, perfect diamagnets. We can use our superconductors, so these would pretty much fulfill that. Uh, of course, we don't have materials which have mu r infinite, but we can make something which has a very large mu r. So, and uh, then it turns out, you know, using real materials, it's actually better not to just have one central rod and just one shell of superconductor, but sort of layer it up. And there's some more details I don't want to go into. Essentially, what we use is we use stainless steel uh, wrapped with the superconductor around. Um, so in the experiment, this looks somewhat like this. Uh, so this is, again, one half of our cavities. There's two qubits, this time on sapphire, in there. And back here, you can actually see this uh, magnetic hose. Um, it's, well, this is sort of still, how should I call it, prototype like 1.0 or something, 1.1 maybe. Um, so it's pretty big still. So but we think we can even make this smaller. Um, in this case, uh, for these qubits, we have also measured the coherence times of a few microseconds slightly uh, smaller, but that's actually not the fault of this, this hose, but uh, we have actually overcoupled the cavity, so they are per cell limited by the cavity. Um, so what we can do now to see if this hose really works um, is we can apply the following sequence. So we can try and read out our qubit, but before that we apply a pi pulse to see if we can excite it. Um, and we have a flux pulse before where we sort of change the frequency of the qubit from one value to another one, then do a big step and then bring it back. And we sort of sweep our pi pulse through and we do that for varying frequency to figure out what happens to the qubit. And what we can see is the following. So we start out right around 6.3 uh, gigahertz, then do a jump to higher frequencies, a bigger jump to lower frequencies, and then come back. Uh, and this is inside the superconducting box. So you can see that the rise time here is something like a few hundred nanoseconds or so. So it's actually quite fast. Um, um, uh, and uh, it, it seems to you know, jump quite nicely. There is no hysteresis, it looks like. Um, it turns out we can actually um, measure this transfer function and uh, do a sort of a deconvolution. Essentially, sort of what I can do is I can overshoot in this initial pulse and then come back down um, and sort of then go from this frequency to another one even faster. Um, so if I maybe sort of drag out what happens to the resonance frequency, you can see you have this slow rise, but if we do this, um, sort of overshoot, we can actually see we do a very fast step 
and sort of from here to there, this is sort of 50 nanoseconds, and so this means this is even faster than that. And um, here we haven't done this deconvolution perfectly. So you can see we actually have this little overshoot, and then it comes back down. So this was sort of a, just a, a quick try from my PhD student to try and realize that. We have to do that properly, but we, we know how to do that. So this means with this hose, we can really tune uh, these 3D transmons inside this big microwave resonators. Yeah, I'm pretty much done. Um, and um, uh, we really have all the building blocks at hand. Maybe just one thing, uh, we've also been working on implementing these waveguides. So we actually have um, realized waveguides. We have these lambda half microwave resonators. They show very nice cues for these sort of 2D structures right around a million. Uh, the advantage here is those are super simple to fabricate. And normally, if you want to see like Q of a million for a CPW, you have to apply very, very fancy um, um, manu uh, microfabrication techniques. Um, but it's sort of, again, the sort of specific architecture why they are so good. Um, and sort of this is our waveguide where we can sort of have many, many slots with this loading system where we can sort of put in qubits, uh, resonators, and sort of build up a very, very complicated system to pretty much our liking. Uh, and so we can really sort of have the resonators talk very efficiently to the propagating waves, use them to measure it, and the qubits sort of sit wherever we want. Below the cutoff, if they shouldn't talk to the waveguide, above the cutoff, if you wanted to have them talk to the propagating modes. So we have the full flexibility there. Okay, and with that, I'm actually at the end. So I hope I could give you a sort of brief idea on how we think we can sort of build up these sort of interacting uh, um, well, few many body systems, however you want to call it, and that we first sort of made the first steps in this direction that we have all the fundamental building blocks essentially available in the lab, and we hope we can sort of make much larger structures within the well uh, next couple months or so um, and let me really finish with a picture of the group and the people who actually do the work here uh, and yeah, thank you very much for your attention.